The song, This Is How We Do It, is a 90s hit that keeps on giving to its writer and performer, Montel Jordan. It recently is used in a commercial for Uber Eats, but the song title also describes the almost 30-year marriage between Montel and his wife, Kristen. How they do it is what they share with other married couples through their ministry and marriage retreat center. That's where I went one-on-one with them. But first, the origin of the song that makes it all possible. That song was originally generated from my college days. Uh, I was at uh, Pepperdine University, Malibu, California, uh, joined a fraternity, kept outside. Uh, when we would go to our parties, all the DJs, every single party, every single time that we would go there, um, whenever the DJ played the song by Slick Rick, uh, children's story, that dun 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 It did not matter what room it was in, there was an automatic charge or energy that hit the room. And no matter where I was, no matter what demographic, that song itself, that hip hop song always captured the room. And so because I was a singer and a kind of a rap singer at the time, you know, kind of coming up as a college student, I thought to myself, if I ever get in the music business, I'm going to sing over that song. As that was that was a thought. Was many, many years before I ever got to Def Jam or anything, I said, if I ever get into music business, I'm going to sing over that song right there. And understand, this is a time when uh, a lot of record labels or artists and producers were starting to sample songs from the 80s and, and, and stuff like that. And so when my opportunity came, this is how we do it. Even as we got the record deal and we started working on the album, this is how we do it was still the very last song that I recorded for the album because... It had to be done right. So we recorded something for the honeys, all these different songs of my first album. I had the track. That this is how we do a track, but we had to say the right thing on that track. Little known fact about this is how we do it. Um, if you go back to a song like Marvin Gaye's Got to Give It Up, if you listen even today, there's a crowd in the song. Mm-hmm. There's an atmosphere where you can hear people laughing and it's like and a party. It's a party. It's a party. It's built into the very foundation of the song. And somehow when we were recording, this is how we do it. Before I recorded vocals, before I recorded anything, I put a bunch of people in the room, put a bunch of alcohol in the room. I turned on the microphone and said, y'all have a party. And literally I have the sound. If you go back and listen to this is how we do it. The same way you have this Marvin Gaye atmosphere that's captured into the fabric of the song. This is how we do it has a party atmosphere captured into the fabric of the song. And if you listen, you'll hear kind of way in the back, oh, there's people laughing and people having a party. And that was a part of of constructing a, a record now that's going on 30 something, almost 30 years. What's the story? The, the story of This Is How We Do It is a kid from South Central LA is documenting street life in a way that NWA was documenting gangster rap I'm now documenting life in South Central LA, but from the standpoint of a singer as opposed to a rapper. So those words, when I say, this is how we do it, it's Friday night, I feel all right, the party's here on the West Side. I've just laid out almost like a movie opening up. We're on the West Side, I told you what day of the week it is, like everybody, to this day, almost 30 years later, on Friday nights, people put that song on because they've been uh, instructed on how a party is. So I said, I reached for my 40, which I don't even know if people drink 40s anymore. I, I don't, haven't drank in 20 something years, but I said, I reached for my 40 and I turn it up. I designated driver, take the keys to my truck. So what's happening is I am giving you alcohol. I'm giving you a reality, but I'm also giving you how to do it safely. Right? So I said, uh, uh, designated driver, take the keys to my truck, hit the Shaw, Crenshaw Boulevard. Cause I'm faded. Uh, Honey's in the street said money. Oh, he made it. That's just a rah uh, I said, feel so good in my hood tonight. Summertime skirts, the guys in Kanai. That was a shout out to Carl Kanai, which at the time was a black clothing line. I said, all the gangbangers forgot about the drive-by. Okay. I've just said in a song, gangbangers, which somebody was saying, oh, you're singing about gangbangers. No, I said, I'm recognizing an accurate reality in South Central LA that there are Crips and Bloods, there are gangbangers, but they forgot about the drive-by because they're having a good time. So I'm giving you in the song, this dichotomy, I'm giving you this tension of, yeah, there's alcohol, but there's there's designated drivers. Oh, there's gangbangers. Oh, but they're not killing each other. There's all these different elements of street life in South Central LA of how to survive. And that was how I survived. Uh, and I think that was what was given 
uh, in the song. Montel told me the song has been used in up to 50 commercials, from Uber One to Train You All, to a spot with Shaquille O'Neal for the general car insurance. I thought the song at some point um, gave me identity. Um, I think it, it helped define me back then. Now, I think I define the song. So from that standpoint, I think that uh, it's, a, it's an honor to have a song that people, that it still resonates with people. But I think that the beauty of that song now is that it doesn't define who I am. I define who it is. The song, This Is How We Do It, was released in 1995, a year after Montel and Kristen married. Well, after you all got married and you came up with this song, This Is How We Do It, it is still a very popular. I thought you were going to sing it. I thought oh. you were going to sing it right there. Does everybody sing it to you? Most times they do. When they see you? It's an involuntary response. Everybody is just like, yeah, you did this song. This, and they just automatically play. <laughs> so I was waiting for it, but it's okay. Sorry. <laughs> she said, no. <laughs> I love it. You're there here. Yep. I'm here. We're not singing that. No, it's okay. It's good. That's good. But when you first got into the record business, you all had been married a year. But they described you by your maiden name and as his manager, and you had to say you were married to the music. That would have caused some friction with me. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. Um, so I grew up, um, my mom's a single mom, and she taught me how to be self-sufficient, independent. You got this. Everything you touch is blessed, but never once did it include with a man. Right. So totally counterculture to what we know as marriage, right? So when the record label steps to me and says, so if they know you're married, they're never going to take you seriously as a manager. I was like, that goes against every mantra I've ever known. Self-sufficient, independent, you got the, it would go against it. And they said, well, I'll never take you seriously. So if they weren't going to take me seriously, I was like, then that's okay. They don't have to know that I'm married. Right. And same with me as a, as a recording artist, they're like, nobody wants an unavailable married you know, R&B artists. Yep. You have to be sexy. You have to be available. You have to, they have to want you. Uh, the idea was women have to want to be with you. Men have to want to be you. And so from that standpoint, those are the personas that, that I took on. I don't know if I could be a good husband. I don't know if I could be a good father, but I believe I could be somebody that, that people want or want to be. And so I took on that persona and that allowed me to be this single available guy in the forefront uh having uh a manager who's super super you know having a, a black woman uh female manager to me was a great way to be able to substantiate myself in the in the business uh but as far as marriage goes it was a recipe for disaster for us yeah. early on because we didn't put it first that's right so how did you fix it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God fixed it. Yeah. If I'm 100% honest, because yeah. the truth is, is that like we signed up for foolishness that we didn't even understand. We yeah. didn't even comprehend because like when we first met, the context of when you get married, you're coming under his covering and you're becoming a part of the covering that he offers. But when I rejected yeah. that by saying, I'd rather be your manager and I keep my maiden name, I'm rejecting his covering and I, in, essentially was rejecting him and so for the long time we it played out horrifically but then we would come to a cataclysmic point and god would redeem what was broken yeah and, and i love that you said broken i love that you said how did you fix it and god was the one that fixed it because um you can't fix something that's not broken and we did realize that what we were functioning in as a marriage was something that was broken it, it didn't just need adjusting it didn't just need it uh, was uh, Broken. You know, so it was broken. Uh, and so from that standpoint, the idea that uh, not only was it broken, but we broke it. Yeah. Uh, when, when we could take the responsibility that this thing is broken because we broke it. Now, the healing part and the fixing part of it, God, I think, can step in and say, now that you recognize you're the one that broke this. Like Def Jam didn't break it. Right. Def Jam played with it. Yep. Okay, the, the music business didn't break it. The music business 
maybe destroyed parts of it or, or uh, didn't do the right things with it, but we were the ones that allowed it to be in places for it to get broken. Absolutely. Uh, and so we also were the ones that allowed it to be in places to get fixed and to get healed. And so. So did you all go to counseling? Yes. Yes, we went to counseling. We went to uh, a pastor back in the day, sent us to a retreat, uh, a retreat to go away. We learned about uh, triggers. We learned about things that were broken before we got. So we started to learn that not only did we did we break our marriage, but there were pieces of us that were broken before going into it. Yeah. marriage. So our marriage, was, I was broken. Yeah. I was broken. I was broken going into a marriage, thinking marriage is the thing that heals us. The it's going to fix us. That fixes us. I didn't have, other than, a, than an uncle now who's been married for going on close to probably 50 yeah. years, mm-hmm. uh, and her grandparents that were married for 60-something. 62. 62 years. Uh, there are not marriages that sustained in my entire family history. Like, I can't point back to a, a grandfather, a great-grandfather. A, like, we have one of the longest-standing marriages now in the history of both of our families. And so understanding uh, the brokenness that we that God had to fix, we inherited that. So it wasn't just like we just grabbed some stuff and, and just broke it. We inherited some brokenness that wasn't even those, our, it wasn't even their fault. Uh, you know, it's just the world is broken. Uh, but the desire to be fixed, the desire to be healed is what we want to bring to the table now, not just because God did it for us, but because he did it for us. We believe he'll do it for others. Well, that's what I love about where we are, that this is going to be a retreat center for couples. How did that idea come about? So this has been a dream for us for about 15 years. Yeah. And it's because that's where we found peace and that's where we found um, restoration. Mm-hmm. in this place and we learn how to become friends and realize that a lot of times we uh, were fighting each other when we need to be fighting the enemy that's coming against us right the right. things that are coming against our marriage we learned that same team like the things that we've learned in our past these are the ways that healthy and successful works so how can we create new patterns how can yeah. we do new things so that's what we do here is create new patterns and create a safe space for people to come and heal and be restored um, back to healthy. Yeah, and I, and I think that curating that safe space for people to be able to come is we found that space. We found that when God is in that space, it's a, a place that uh, that you can be your most vulnerable self. Uh, and so because of that, this space here in Georgia, uh, it allows us the opportunity now to do what we've done for 15 years. But normally it's in somebody's basement. Yeah. Or it's, hey, we got an emergency or, hey, you know, the stories that we can tell you that couples have been through uh, are like unbelievable stories. But you're coming to the rescue. It's like you're uh, uh, an ER on wheels that mm-hmm. I got to get to this person's living room. I got to get to them. I got to get to them. Uh, and we've done that, you know, for many, many years, for many years. And now God gave us a space that said, OK, instead of being this mobile marriage ER let me give you a foundational space where people can actually come and I can do what I do best in a safe and peaceful, peaceful place. Kristen is using her newfound talent of interior design to redesign and decorate the home for the couples who will come for counseling. The bedrooms are spacious with private baths and each is individually decorated. There are also spots for group sessions on the upper level and the lower level. The property is large enough for cabins to be built on it later. That's part of their long-term plan. The living room already is used every Sunday for their virtual Masterpiece Church service. It streams live at 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. each Sunday. Montel is an ordained minister now. He and Kristen have as their goal to transform one million marriages. The Jordans now call Georgia home, and how they got here is a story in itself. Okay, so (laughs) that's a funny story, too. Um, So in 98, we uh, we come to visit um, Georgia. He was writing with uh, Candy first, and they were writing for TLC Mm -hmm. and for... um, Producer Shakespeare, we were out here producing and, and writing songs. 
Uh, and while we're out here, we spent like three days and like nothing. For Destiny's Show. Yeah, facts. Like, and nothing, nothing came out. Nothing. Like we're like top riders and nothing is coming out. And finally, one day Shakespeare is like, yo, um, you want to take a look at, uh, you know, some property? I, I just bought this new house. You know, I'm not familiar with Georgia. We we go over uh, into this, I think it was uh, light like thing area. Uh, roll up onto this property or whatever. This house uh, is one of those 10,000 square feet houses, six car garage. Like it, it's an amazing property that sits on like four or five acres of land. And he's talking to me now. I'm fresh out of California. Uh, and he says to me, yeah, a doctor built it. And then he walked away from it. And I think I can get it for about seven, you know? And I'm like, okay, cool. This is a, like, this is definitely a seven million dollar house. <laughs> and he's like, no, 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 that's seven million, seven hundred thousand. And I was like, hold on, this house is a seven hundred thousand dollar. Oh, you know the music videos where the people are up on the balcony with the champagne glasses on the cars. It's that house. And I'm like, that house is. I'm about to buy a house in Burbank for one point two million dollars. You tell me this house is. You can reach out the window and touch your neighbor. I was like, I gotta see. I gotta see more. And so we start driving around through subdivisions, which I did not for me because they don't have those in California. Driving through subdivisions, I see a house, you know, five bedroom, four bath, two hundred fifty thousand, three hundred thousand, three hundred fifty thousand. I was like, oh, this is crazy. She's not gonna believe it. So I'm not even gonna try to explain it. I call her up. I'm like, hey, I need you to get on a plane, come uh, and come like, to Atlanta. This is like four o'clock. Okay, well we'll make a plan. Atlanta time, like, which is like one o'clock her time. He's like, yeah, we've got, no, no, no. I need to get on a plane now and come to Atlanta like, right You know, we live in Burbank, right? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I need to get on a plane now. So she finds a babysitter, I think with mom, whatever, catches a red eye yeah. because it's now, you know, four or five o'clock. She gets on a red eye, comes to Atlanta. I pick her up from the airport. She is pissed off. I don't know if I can say it on camera as a pastor, but she's pissed. Uh, we go to the hotel, get some rest. We wake up. Uh, I hop in, in the car and I start driving her around these subdivisions. Uh, and I drive to a subdivision and I tell her, hey, go check out that mailbox. So she goes and she gets out uh, the mailbox and goes, looks at the house and sees the little thing, you know, 200,000. And then I, I drive to the next one, 300,000. Now she's in the car and now she's pointing at it. <laughs> and so literally after doing that for a couple of hours, we got back to the hotel. She called her mom. She said, mom, we moving to Atlanta. Mm-hmm. That's how we got to Atlanta. Well, that's the the real estate version of how we got to Atlanta. But the real estate version of how we got to Atlanta was um, a lot of hidden stuff that I had done in my life and in our marriage in Los Angeles in Hollywood had been covered up so deeply that God was going to do something in us and he couldn't do it in Hollywood. He had to... um, I believe he was going to expose some things, but he couldn't do it in the spotlight or he wouldn't do it in the spotlight. And so he made it seem as though, well, you're going to move to Atlanta because of real estate and opportunities and because of the face and are sure everybody that's out in Atlanta's the next new whatever. That's why you're coming to Atlanta. But literally it was because God said, I'm going to expose you and I'm going to do it with grace so that when I expose you, Uh, It's going to happen in a way that I can protect you as opposed to Hollywood getting a hold of our lives. And it it would have broke us. I mean, there's no question. And and the thing is, we've we've been in that story. We've been in that place. Uh, It's just it just so happened that God was gracious enough to pull us out of Hollywood, put us on the backside of the woods somewhere Mm -hmm. in Georgia where nobody knew us. No family. No, no. We didn't know nobody. And so when we went through our our journey of marriage, our journey of infidelity, our journey of all of those pieces, um, God was just gracious enough to shield us where People Magazine and all the different tabloids didn't get a hold of it. So at least the narrative of marriage was something that we got a chance to tell, mm-hmm. and it wasn't the world telling our story. When you look at the the, the stories, the, the Kanye, the Kardashian, like, there are stories that we look at and everybody's just like, oh, I can't believe it. How is it? It's because uh, a lot of times I'm grateful that God graced us enough to allow whatever we were journeying through. He covered us so that the story being told from it was one that's going to give him glory as opposed to us getting the glory for it ourselves. 
Montel is comfortable now with being called pastor, but that was not always the case. <laughs> I did not want to be no pastor. I wanted to be the NBA ball player. I wanted to be uh, WW before it was WWE, it was WWF. I wanted to be a wrestler. I wanted to be somebody uh, that seemingly was influential in other people's lives according to what I saw and what I thought was was influential. The, the pastors, uh, as a kid growing up, had this thing about, you know, or people looked at pastors like, oh, that pastor's driving that kind of car or they taking people's money or this. And, and that was how I grew up. And so I always was like, well, I don't want people to look at me, you know, like that. Uh, and so it really was a stigma I had to even break into adulthood when people finally said, okay, Montel, you're a pastor. When I took my first job as a worship pastor at a, before even pastoring a church, I took a job as a worship pastor at a mega church. I thought it's a, a job as a worship leader. I didn't think it was a pastoral position that came along with it. And I got there on this job on day one. There's a license there that says Montel Jordan pastor. I called HR immediately. It was like, hey, somebody made a mistake. You might want to come get this because uh, I am not a pastor. They're like, oh, yeah, you're a pastor. They like, nope, not a pastor. I'm a leader. The guy that hired me to I was going to be the worship leader. He was like, no, you're a pastor. Like, nope, nope. And so I fought for months like I am not a pastor. I don't from a childhood, you know, trauma almost. I, I don't want that title. I don't want that. And now, man, what an honor. What an honor that somebody would look and say, that's my pastor. Uh, and so I, I don't take it lightly. Uh, I wear it loosely uh, because we're, we are together. Um, we serve God's people. They, it's, a, it's not our church. It's not our people. It's not my church. It's not our ministry. These are God's people. And we have been given an honor to help guide and feed and nurture and shepherd and pastor people who need uh, to feel closer or to be reconnected to God. There's Masterpiece Church, the Masterpiece album, and the book, This Is How We Do It, Making Your Marriage a Masterpiece. I love the fact that in everything you do, you have the word masterpiece, but it's P-E-A-C-E-Y. That is uh, Ephesians 2 and 10. Uh, the scripture says, for you are God's workmanship, or you are God's masterpiece. Um, and I think it's the idea that God created something that's completely unique in us when we recognize the value that he placed in us. Uh, and because of that, that's just the word, our life scripture that kind of stuck out to us. So workmanship or God's handiwork or God's craftsmanship, like the, the very work of his hands is something that is a masterpiece. Uh, but then the spelling of that, we believe that of all the things that we've accomplished in our lives in management and travel in music and awards, all those different things. When we sit back, it is the space and the time that we have in our marriage, in our children, in our grandchildren, in our legacy. Those are the things that are sustaining. Those are the things that have moved us from success into a place of significance. And because those things are significant, we believe that when you master a peace <laughs> in your life, uh, then you master, you know what I mean? Peace. Now you shoot your services right. in this room and it's virtual right now. Do you ever plan on having a brick and mortar church building? Only if God says so. You see me saying no. <laughs> no, no. She's saying only if God says so. And your hair is going like this. The thing is this, is that this is what God has called us to. And he's told us very specifically that this is the pathway for us. So um, I think the traditional way that it has been done is a brick and mortar place. Mm -hmm. um, I think God has always called us to do unusual things. Everything we've ever done has always been a let's reinvent the wheel kind of feel. Mm -hmm. And so this is very similar uh, that it hasn't been done where this is how they began. People have online services and that kind of thing, but it is not oh, where they started difficult. in the virtual space. And so I would agree. Um, if God told us to do it, yeah. we would do it. Is it what we want to do? No. But here's what here's what I would say is a beautiful thing of that. Um, obedience is obedience. Uh, obedience isn't necessarily. I know people that would love to have a church. I want to plant a church. I want to pastor. I want to do this. 
I, I said, you know, when when Jesus says, not my will, but your will be done, he's, he's going to be crucified. He doesn't want to be crucified, but he says to his dad, it's not my will that this would happen, but if it's your will, then I'll do it. That's how I look at ministry every single day. We can be the lighthouse that says, if they can do it, it's a possibility that I can do it. So we're just the hope to get you to the other side of the mountain. Yep. So I guess that's the case of, this is how we do it. I know. Yay! I knew it was in there. I, I said, I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor. I knew it was in there. I didn't know when it was coming. I didn't know if I was going to say it, but thank you. Jesus. I knew you wanted I knew it, it was so in I gave there. It to you. <laughs> that's what pastors do. They pull the good stuff out of you. They, they say get it, it out. To the end. I knew you wanted it, so I did not want to disappoint. Thanks for watching. Now, you want to know who will be going one-on-one -on -one with me next? Subscribe now to Peachtree TV so you don't miss the next episode of Monica Pearson One-on-One. -on -One.